Mental illness is an opportunity that does not spare our most creative, our most talented, or our most successful. Tonight, our special guest is Maria Bamford, a Duluth native and nationally renowned comedian who talks about mental illness in her stand-up act, and that's next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. Now, when I was in high school, my drama director said to me, Carolyn, there's a funny story in every experience you've ever had and you ever will have. And that was really the most amazing revelation to me and became, as trite as it may sound, my coping statement that I use to this day. Well, however good I may be at turning uh, adversities into funny stories tonight my very special 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 guest has me beat in spades because she does this for a living Maria Bamford is a Duluth native who's been described as one of the most original voices in stand-up comedy today. See, she's already at it. She's making you <laughs> laugh right now. She speaks openly about her experiences with mental illness and getting help both in her stand-up act and thankfully for us tonight in interviews. And because we don't want you to miss one minute of Maria by being on the telephone, we're going to help you out. We are not taking your calls, so get away from that phone. Get the popcorn, hang out, and join Maria and me. Next time in January, you can start calling again. Tonight, forget it. You can call, but we're not answering. Maria, thank you so <laughs> much no, for being so here. Thank you so much for having me. It's really fun to be in Duluth and to talk about mental health. <laughs> Men mental, mental health, health mental, mental illness. Mental we're going illness. to cover it all. And you know, Let's one of the it. things that I just want to say is that um, one, from somebody who doesn't know what you do, you know, they think like, oh, she makes jokes about mental illness. And you do this, you talk about, you use comedy with mental illness in such a thoughtful, compassionate way that, but that also gets us to stop and think. Well. I'm glad you think that, Carolyn. <laughs> it is subjective, and <laughs> not everybody would agree. But I, uh, yeah, I, I like talking about it. You know, it's been a personal issue, and been through our family, uh, have history of of it. So I, I really, uh, I have a passion for talking about it. Who knows what my passion will be next year? Maybe I'll be really into vegan cooking I doubt it well all I, I can say it. is I'm glad we got I'm glad we got you during your passion for mental illness yes, error exactly thank God now just if so there is a God. In, in case some right that's that's a different show that's a, different that's a different show, show. we're sorry. not doing that show don't get on the phone and call us no no no, no don't no. don't call sorry, us sorry. Yeah, that's, that's okay I said that I am not the views mm. of of the public station. television oh, or this I'm so sorry of Caroline. Duluth oh. you're, you're fine okay Okay, so now we're going to show your clip because not yes. all of you out there may know Maria and what she does. And so we're going to give you a flavor for Maria. And then what you're going to do is you're going to finish watching the show <laughs> and then you're going to get online and you're going to do what I've done for the past two weeks, which is laugh until your face hurts. So, and, and this, the setup for this is you have a show called The Maria Bamford Show, which is 20 episodes. This is from episode number 19. And this is a clip of Maria calling her insurance company trying to get a mental health care appointment. Yeah. Let's roll it, that film, as they say. Oh, yes. Now I'm buying health insurance, something called value options, but it's mostly this woman named Shirley. Okay, so you have, like, psychological problems. Well, I just need a referral for a therapist in Los Angeles County. So it's not something you could talk about with your friends? Well, I do, but they asked me to come out, and I'm like, well, I can't come out because I'm filthy, and they're like, why don't you take a shower? And I say, no, it's on the inside. Oh, okay, so you crazy. I believe the clinical diagnosis is, is obsessive compulsive disorder. You know what I do when I feel down? I'm too blessed to be stressed. But when I feel down, I go and get my laugh on. You're going to go see a comedy show? Yes, I have, Shirley. Yes, I have. 
This is this is really great. This is great <laughs> stuff, Maria. And and part of this is is that you know I think that also has been some people's experience as well, which is what makes it sort of funny and not funny at the same time. Right. 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 And I think it, I mean things are always getting better. You know, not everybody has. Um, that experience, but I found that was so interesting during, within the mental health like services that there was some level of prejudice. <laughs> you know, I was like, what? <laughs> like I'm trying to tell somebody my symptoms and they'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about or, or, uh, or that, you know, th that sounds weird to me. And I'd be like, well, I read about it in this, you know, this book or this, uh, you know, or looked it up on the internet. You know, I mean, I think it's just like any other, uh, uh, illness today where sometimes the patients are have so much more education or information because you can Google it. And, 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 and you, you raise a really, really important point here, which is if you, if you fall into the hands of the wrong person, yeah. you know, if you're going to see somebody who, and you feel like you know more than they know, yes. then maybe you're seeing the wrong person right. because the right person's out there. Um, but it can take, yeah, it can take a long time. And, and then if you have the other hurdle of you know, not having health care, not having access to it or uh, insurance or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's really hard. Because, you know, I went to, I think, you know, over the course of my lifetime, I've been to <laughs> dozens of therapists, but even in, you know, people who were, um, it, it just, you know, it was helpful, but not that helpful, you know, and um, I think it, yeah, so it just takes a while, and some of them who certainly don't understand it, you know, who um, I tried to tell, uh, this is probably like 15 years ago, I tried to explain my symptoms of OCD to a therapist in Los Angeles, and she had no experience in it, and just said, you know, I'm going to have to, uh, uh, you know, if you're thinking of hurting your so other people, I'm going to have to, and what it is, is it's unwanted violent Unwan sexual thoughts, unwanted thought syndrome, which is different from psychosis or um, having actual aggression. It's the fear that you're going to have. So it's like fear that your hands are going to get dirty, the fear that you're, because you've had a thought that you're going to do it. So we talked about this, in, in fact, in, in one of our shows last year, if any of you were watching on obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, talked about, we talked about this last year about that obsessive compulsive disorder is not just doing the behaviors like the obsessive hand washing, the compulsive hand washing, or the compulsive checking, oh, did I, did I unplug the iron enough? But for some people, it's obsessive thinking mm -hmm. about kind of extreme Situations. Extreme situations. That right? are and taboo. That, that, that are, are taboo. taboo. And you started experiencing that actually in childhood? In childhood, probably about like nine or ten. And I've heard that that's, I mean, I don't know, I've heard that from other people that they had the same experience around puberty kind of thing. And so what was that like for you? Tell us a little bit about that because here you are a nine-year-old. Because yeah. that's, that's young. That's, that, this yeah. would be scary enough for an adult. Yeah. Here you are, 10 years old or so. I just, I mean, I guess I just felt, yeah, sort of terrified. And I thought, well, if I'll just stay up all night, I was worried, concerned that I was going to, uh, and I watched a lot of TV. And so, uh, I don't know, I guess it's not that funny, but I thought uh, the funny time wasn't funny at all. I was like, I was worried I was going to hurt my family, that I would, you know, kill my family in some way. And I don't know, and I'd never been a violent child. I'd never, you know, hit anyone. I think I, well, I did give a right hook to Pat Stoffenecker when he stole my volleyball, uh, but that was, Maybe you know. Maybe it coming because well, he stole your volleyball. Clearly, over and over again for a number of months, and I finally, uh, no, that wasn't right. Not Violence is never the answer, but I, yeah, I, uh, so then uh, I, I, I couldn't tell any, I mean, the powerful thing about it, I think a lot of postpartum depression, I've heard that that has, sometimes people get OCD from that of worrying they're going to harm their baby, mm -hmm. um, or, uh, fear that, or some people have it, fear I'm going to jump off something, like they they have to stay away from the cliff because they are, are afraid they're going to jump off it. It's like doing something you know you would never do, have never acted out on, and yet the more you think about it or try to make it go away, the stronger the belief becomes. The, well, the more you, re, you reinforce the and thought. Reinforce it, it yeah. It, it's yeah. like it sticks like glue in your brain. And I think what, what I have heard, and you can tell me if, if I'm wrong and what some of, of the people who I've seen have, have explained it to me, is that 
the fact that I'm thinking it feels like it means I'm going to do it. Right, and that I'm a bad person. And and I think that in the, I mean, at least from what my mother's told me, and she's mm -hmm. a religious person, that, you know, different saints, you know, that were obsessed with sin. And it was a very similar process of like worrying, you know, having these sinful thought, and you got to erase it with a, a, a prayer or, you know, this sort of compulsive thinking, trying to, um, get rid of the thoughts. And then how did you wind up, so for a long time you didn't tell anybody, mm -hmm. and then how did people come to find out, like your family at some point? I told my mom in confidence and then she said, because I wasn't sleeping at night because I was worried I was going to hurt everybody, <laughs> and so I wanted to stay up and make sure I didn't do it. And then my mom, she sent me to a therapist, and I went to, we went to the Damiano Center and had a, um, a therapist there um, and then where I basically just slept on her couch it was just sort of like a comfortable place to just like feel like sa safe or something like okay, feel now, safe. I, I do want to interrupt and just sort of say to the viewers that mostly therapy is not, not about sleeping, sleeping <laughs> on our couch I just want to, that was Maria's experience I don't want to invalidate your experience Maria but that's not what goes on in my office it was very therapeutic I okay. have to say but <laughs> Yeah. Are you my, suggesting I'm, I should try that no, sometimes no, as a well, treatment strategy? No, no I, well, and I was, I think I was younger, I was young, and I, I didn't really know what to talk about. Like, I couldn't tell the therapist what was happening. And I'm, I'm almost glad that I didn't, because I don't think she would have known what it was. <laughs> and maybe she would have been freaked out by it, because my mom was freaked out. Like, she, she thought for some reason that it meant that I was gay which at the time, uh, very 80s were much more homophobic. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly that's a still a problem now, but was much more than now. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know, she... But, but we, we think your mom was a little not correct on that. Yeah, no, yeah, I that, mean, not that... That, that whether, that, whether you, whatever your sexual orientation, we really don't think that obsessive compulsive thoughts are linked to sexual orientation. Sexual orientation, exactly. Or you know, whether you're, but, but, but I have gone to professionals in the past who didn't know what it was, and, um, and it was, you know, uh, and I finally went to a, a cognitive behavioral therapist who, you know, was well-versed in all the different kinds of OCD, and it was something that had been, you know, terrible for me, you know, my whole life. It was gone within I think maybe two months of therapy. So, which is amazing for you, yeah. right? I mean, here you are, you suffer for years and years. Yeah, and, and it then, affected all my relationships. Like I didn't want to spend time with people alone. Um, I didn't want to tell anybody about it. I, uh, part of the reason I do stand up is there's a real safety. You know, there's really, you know, there's clear boundaries. I can't get at anyone. <laughs> So, so that's the because you know my so, hands are busy. You, you know it's so funny. Like you describe stand up as as real safety, and this is like an activity that would petrify ninety nine percent of Americans. But it's no, it's a very controlled environment, and you're very much in control. You know, like people can yell things out, but you're amplified. You're lit. Everyone can understand what you're saying. That person usually has had a couple of drinks. You know, you, and everyone's on your side you, to some, to a certain extent, a, a social level. Like everyone's like, "Well, that person's up in front of the microphone. You better be nice to her." And uh, I love that. I love that idea, which actually, like, we can kind of take home in our own life is that most of the time, that when we're afraid of being a, about, like, when people call us out in public, is that uh, everybody else in the room is on our side. Yeah, nobody, I mean, usually, and and even the person who's yelling out or whatever heckling, even if it is a very negative heckle, is usually just trying to speak up for themselves. Like, it's just trying to say, I feel uncomfortable. I don't like the concepts that are being discussed in this area. It's my birthday. You know, like, they just want to be heard, you know, and... And of course, that can be frightening the way it comes out. Like sometimes it comes out in a way that I find, you know, it's like, oh, my knees will start to shake. If you know, tell somebody says you're not funny, or you shut up, or any number of swearings, or or uh, that, that or, we don't say on public television. We do not say on public television. <laughs> let's let's get that clear. We do not, and none of which that we are saying right now are the views of this station. <laughs> Or anyone associated oh, with anyone it. associated with this station. 
The, so you were <laughs> saying two months with yeah. this cognitive behavioral therapist. And it was done. And it, and it was done. And the, the type of therapy that you participated in was a therapy called then flooding, right? Flooding, yeah. So what they had me do was have a, me tape um, a script of what my worst fear was, going all the way through the fear, like farther than I'd ever gone through the fear, like through the most, most like the worst case scenario, the disgusting, yes. things I hadn't even got, thought of, and then listen to it over and over and over again, listen to it and with, um, like right before I spent time alone with somebody, which was like my, I would feel frightened with that. And it's, I think what the idea with flooding is that your anxiety as a human being can only go to a certain level. You can't hold your breath forever. Yeah, so soon, and it just gets bored and you have to relax. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that was uh, that was just so wonderful and I'm so grateful for all the work that people did to and you know that. what's so interesting about this is that that that's a treatment technique that is hard to get people to do because it sound it's scary in the beginning to do that because in the beginning you're having to do all of the things that you don't want to do that you know like you said that your mind hadn't even gone that far and yet it kind of works like magic almost it's amazing like and, and I you know, I had some, I mean, these were also unwanted sexual thoughts, unwanted, I mean, things that were like very embarrassing issues, things I did not want to write down or say out loud for fear, you know, of them happening, you know, just these very powerful, I think that's what makes them so powerful is there's some strong belief of like, oh, this, this is who I am. It, despite all the signs and the, um, evidence that's against that, 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 that there's something wrong with me or something. So, um, yeah, like I, I had a great grandmother who she had six children and she ended up staying most of the time in her, uh, uh, room for most of her life as an invalid. And you just think, I wonder what that was. Yeah. You because know? we kind of don't think it was like an invalid. Do yeah. We? And <laughs> like, look at looking back on it. Yeah, looking back on it, I mean that she could have been. She could have had, this, had something like that where she was didn't want to be near her kids because she was afraid of hurting them, or you know, or, or whatever. You know, I mean, just and and I know that I only know my own experience. I'm sure there, are, uh, you know, other times where people have genuine aggression and should be you know helped in a different way. But uh, my experience was uh, was very different and. And, and we want to say that, by and large, people with obsessive compulsive disorder as well yeah. are some of the least likely people to be aggressive, aggressive so violent, or, yeah. Or and 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 in general, and, and we'd like to make the point of this is that um, people with mental illness are more likely to be the victims of violence. We 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 say this sort of throughout the season, and here it is. It's well, bears well worth well worth repeating again. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm so impressed with is that. Here you are, you said that you suffered with this for approximately 15 years or so, and, but you were persistent. You know, you were persistent in getting help, and I think what always concerns me is that there are other people out there who've given up, and so part of why we do the show is to show you that you shouldn't give up, because your persistence speaks, number one, so highly of you, and then it becomes, it truly becomes this message of hope for other people then as well. Well, and th I, I mean, I, I know that's, I've gotten a lot of support and stuff, and I mean, I, and uh, th also the internet is just such, I mean, it's a terrible resource sometimes, but it's also a great resource for, like, I remember when I, I think I put it into an internet search engine, some of my fear and thoughts and stuff, and that came up uh, the CBT Center in Los Angeles, and it was um, so helpful, you know, so, um, I think sometimes you can find help on the internet as well if you're too afraid yeah. to see somebody in person. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was the support that you've gotten. And so we're going to take just a little bit break, but don't, don't, like, don't go way far away because we're going to come right back because we have another special, special, special guest joining us. We'll be right back.
We are back. See, I told you we were going to be back really quickly. So one of the things that we talk about on this show is that mental illness doesn't just affect the person who's having it, but the, per the people in their lives. And Maria kind of alluded to that. And part of how the people in their lives can be affected, but they can also affect the person who has the mental illness by being there and being a support to them. And so we have on the show tonight, thanks to Maria who talked her into it, her, her special sister, which is her only sister, but she's a special sister, Sarah Seidelman. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. And so you are the older sister or the younger sister? I'm the older sister. But not, but not, but not way, way older, by about three, three years, I think is what, three years is what I think you said. And so yeah. when Maria first started um, having problems, she, was, she said that she was around 10 years old, you would have been around 13 years old. At what point in time did you, as a, as, as a kid, become aware of that, and how was that handled in your family? I think I knew even before that was happening that, you know, that Maria was a really sensitive child, you know. I mean, I always felt very protective of her, and I don't know if that's normal for older siblings. Maybe everybody feels that way, but I always wanted to kind of, like, shield her from the world. Like, I was always worried that she wasn't like tough enough to handle things but um you know the world that was maybe gonna chew her up and spit her out no. I, man look at me now yeah, totally <laughs> look at her now not so much no and and, and that that's <laughs> and it's kind of hilarious for you to sit there for me to hear you sit there and say like i was very protective of her because like she's getting her jabs in now and just in case you haven't been watching yes. um yes. the maria yes. bamford show yes. um and uh, right, right. And, and so so sometimes what happens um, in families is that it's not just it's not just the kid who the kid with the problem who gets sent to therapy, but family therapy yeah. becomes yes, part of go. part part of it. And was that a part of your experience then yes. as well? Yes, we went to family therapy. Yes, and that was a really interesting experience. And yes, sometimes Maria we, we would all get there, and then Maria would like curl up in a ball on the couch, and then it would be my mother and I. We would like triangulate. I think I remember learning the concept of triangulation. 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 At, at, at the age of fourteen. Yeah. A useful skill sometimes when you're a fourteen-year-old girl. Yeah, and it was dark. It was winter. I recall it being oh. cold and drafty in that building. I mean, I don't remember too much about it, but. Um, but yeah, but it was, yeah, that's what we did. I mean, my mom was just like, we're going to go to therapy. We're going to work on these things. We've got to, we've got to figure out what's going on, which I mean, thank goodness. Cause I think that kind of made a life for us all where we could ask for help when we needed it. And I mean, with my own family and myself, I've certainly followed that too. So, so one of the things that, that, that you confided in your mother and then your mother also got you help too, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. She went and got me help, which is really awesome. And I was so grateful cause it was like, I mean, now that I look back, I go, oh, gosh, I'm glad she didn't try to work it out on her own. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, and it has been, you know, because it is a lifelong situation, you know, and, and I mean, Sarah and I have talked about, like, our, on, in our family, we're all on sort of a scale of, you know, having some sort of, yeah, not my, like my, my dad, I would say, has had depression, and my mom has definitely had um, one manic episode, um, uh, for sure, and then you know, so we're on the same meds now. <laughs> and I was diagnosed with ADD, and I kind of see myself as more like exuberant on that scale of things. So I can see where I can see all that ties in a little bit. Well, and and, and you know, partly too, though, what we talk a lot about is that just the, the prevalence of mental illness. Twenty-five percent of the population is going to develop um, some problems, and we know that there are problems that you can diagnose. And we we also know that they're just simply tend to be more prevalent in families and then that was you know if you have both a mother and a father right. with with some mental health genetically you know you're behind the eight ball yeah. then yeah. Yeah. right yeah. yeah and and not that in no different than if you have you know two parents with heart disease right right right, right. yeah yeah and you'd hope I mean I think that's the thing that comes up with mental illness is that people say it's more of like an ethical choice. Like somehow if you would just work harder or just get a better attitude, you know, then, you know, you wouldn't, or you're being dramatic or, and and I won't say that there aren't certain, you know, I, I am a dramatic, emotional person, but, but it, it, yeah, I think people are genuinely having an experience uh, um, if, if, 
whatever they suicidal or whatever the, the thing well and, is. and I think and, and nobody wants that nobody you know like the kind of thoughts that you were describing nobody wants that in their life right I mean I think I think it's time for America to get real about that right nobody wants to be depressed yeah and so even if even if there are some people who get more attention and and for whatever reason because maybe they've been denied attention in their life before that's an ancillary benefit it's like they still don't want to be depressed and they still don't want to feel suicidal and there's still a lot of suffering that's that's going on and no one wants to feel like a victim like nobody right. wants to feel like oh poor you you're you know like you want to feel I mean I know the in the military now you know the, the statistics are I think it's like 7,000 US veterans are dying of suicide every year and you part of the psychology of that organization is kind of suck it up and you can handle it on your own and yet if you have any if you have a mental illness or some sort of brain injury I mean there's just no way you're gonna be able to handle that on your own like I, I couldn't uh, get myself without medication therapy and stuff it to to, uh, to you know I've been hospitalized a few times and th there's just no way I could have gotten out of that by on my own and, and we don't ask people with medical illnesses to, yeah, yeah, to right we, we don't just say like it, it would really be nice if you could just get over that cancer yeah yeah, if yeah. you could get just get over that you know get, get over that diabetes and right. if you really wanted to you could keep your blood sugars in better control than what you have yeah um, if you just if you just thought the right thoughts about that and had a good attitude <laughs> yeah. we yes. we are drawing to a near um, oh. nearing the end and so what do you what do you want to say to America out there well, Miss Maria Duluth, we love you, <laughs> and it's been so great. We're staying down at Fitgers, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, it's pretty cush. Um, yeah, and I'm just great, yeah, I'm grateful to be a part that I grew up in this community where there was a lot of care. I remember I went to, I went to high school and I was not the greatest student sometimes, and people looked out for you know, and said, hey, something's wrong. <laughs> she's she's mm. sleeping all the, through class. And, <laughs> It, it, is, it, is, it is one of the best things I like about Duluth are the, are the caring people. It's not the weather. I got to tell you that, folks. It's not the weather. So, you know, hands down, hands down, Maria is, is our ambassador for hope, don't you think? You know, she told the story of really as, as, as a young child having difficulty uh, with, with mental illness out, out of the blue and surprise, and she hung in there, and, and now she's a nationally, she's famous. She's famous. She's famous, and she is funny. Thank you so much, Maria and Sarah, for coming here and sharing your stories and your family with us tonight. Um, don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links and read my blog, the place where I answer more of your questions but not tomorrow because you, we didn't have any questions from you tonight. So now we'll be taking a two-week break over Christmas. So you will have a lot of time to rest up for the rest of our season when we come back in January for our next show on Thursday, January 9th. Be sure to email us your questions for that show when we'll be talking about coping with the aftermath of suicide. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.